Welcome back, everyone. Hope you had a nice coffee break, just like I did. Let us begin the second session of the day: scaling net zero transition through innovation and digital transformation. To begin the session, may we invite Mr. Kelvin Lee, Director of Strategy and Business Development at Schneider Electric Hong Kong, to deliver his keynote presentation on turning net zero building. From ambition into reality, Mr. Lee, please. Yeah, thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the coffee and got some caffeine jam. And before uh, this presentation, and my presentation will last for around、uh, 15 minutes, and I will talk about a very hot topic right now: is net zero buildings. And what I will cover is、um, we will try to see whether net zero building, I will call it NZB, whether. We really catch it, so it is possible. It is really realistic, and、uh, we need the opportunities to, to achieve it. Or it is just a catch word. Okay, catch word means,、uh, um, yeah, it's a very high-profile, very high-sounding word. A lot of people want to do, but they don't know what to do. And last one, not very good, is catch twenty-two. Catch twenty-two means actually it's not possible. It's some,、um, it's a paradox.、Um, Uh, impossible mission, impossible to achieve. So in the next、uh, 15 minutes, I will talk about what it means by NZB and what are the drivers, or what are the barriers. I will also、uh, show you an example in our Schneider Electric、uh, building in France, which can achieve、uh, somewhat an NZB, and、uh, what we should do, the roadmap. Yeah, and、um, it is just a very high-level introduction because of.、Um, The limitation of time, and but no worries, we will have more fruitful and meaningful discussion in the panel、um, a discussion with you all. So what do,、uh, before I start,、uh, what is NZ?、Uh, NZ net zero. So a lot of people will、uh, talk about NZ and also、uh, carbon neutral. And、um, what I like to say is,、uh, net NZ is a net carbon emission is zero. So it can be no carbon emission, or it is like、uh, a balance. The emission is. Equal to the removal of carbons, and it also covers one, two, three. And just in the previous panel discussion, a lot of people will talk about, oh wow, scope three, very difficult to、uh, do the end set, which is、uh, very true. Eighty percent, seventy to eighty percent of our emissions actually from scope three,、uh, most difficult part, indeed. Yeah, and、um, this is、um, also a topic we need to deep dive into、uh, later, and we will talk about the future. And、uh, for the carbon neutral, and carbon emissions still exist, and you can buy the REC renewable energy certificates、um, from the power utilities to offset those carbon emissions, and that's what we call the carbon neutral. Yeah. And for the key elements in NZB, I would say we should have a linear, circular, and also the radiant. For the linear, it means a reduction. If I can use my own language, well, how to reduce the carbon emissions? For example. You can use electrical energy. Better use your electrical energy to reduce your carbon emission. You can have the architectural design, for example, better ventilation, yeah, in order to reduce it. Or more futuristic will be carbon engineering, which is still、uh, in the very early stage development right now and not commercialized, to be very honest. How about circular circularity? Yeah, is for example, we need to re recycle or reuse. For example, from the waste, for the water, for the materials. Those are the materials that we can recycle. We talk about circular economy right now, and、uh, the carbon、uh, NZB also need to address this. And radiant, we talk about the impact, how we exercise or influence、um, the other parties. For example, more on the management side, how we influence our value chain, no matter it's our suppliers, no matter it's our customers, and the community. Yeah. Educate the community and your customers, and lastly, the full scale is the nature, the biodiversity.、Uh, so that's the whole thing, from small to big. That's the radiation. Yeah. Okay. And a very key, though, so we'll、uh, focus on、uh, electrical. Yeah,、uh, because of the limitation of time. Then,、uh, if we deep dive into electrical, what are the key components? I will try to divide it on supply side and demand side. So for the supply side, a lot of people are talking about renewables, which is very popular in Hong Kong, and thanks to the power utility support by the FIT. So、uh, install the rooftop solars in Hong Kong and our wind turbines,、um, and then the micro generations. I could see a lot of、um, you know、um, uh, buildings, commercial buildings are looking into these areas. For example, the fuel cells, yeah, and also biofuel、uh, micro turbines in order to generate a part of the、uh, renewable energy. 
and energy recovery, for example, the harvesters. Yeah, and uh, we walk on the floor, and there will be some small gadgets to help you to turn the kinetic energy to electrical energy, or use a CHP, you know, combined heat power, yeah, to recover part of the heat energy. Yeah, and um, the lastly is the um, energy storage, which is part um, between uh, supply and demand. Yeah. So for the demand side, a lot of people will look into this one. We use energy efficiency equipment. We reduce our carbon emission, uh, it reduce our energy efficiency, and reduce carbon emissions. For example, 80 to 90 percent, 90 to 95 percent. Yeah, there's a use of um, more energy efficiency equipment. For example, a lot of people are using heat pumps right now. And all electric, for example, the switching from diesel fuel or um, from gasoline to EV. Yeah, a lot of people here actually are EV experts, and uh, you know more than me. And don't forget is um, electricity is the most efficient form of energy, yeah, and uh, electric heating, okay, um, is uh, for example the kitchen, uh, use of uh, electric kitchen, yeah, in order to reduce or uh, reduce the carbon emissions and increase the energy efficiency, and the third one will be the use of uh, digital analytics for optimization, for monitoring and for control, or the OMM operation and maintenance, then we can uh, control the uh, HVAC, uh, the uh, chillers. We can also monitor the power consumption, the workplace efficiency, now, and also the green, no matter it's smart green or the very large grid. And this is the O&M phase. Another one, early, more, more early stage, is the design and build, use of BIM to help you to design. Because when we talk about NZP, we cannot just look at the operation. Actually, we need to start it at the beginning. Yeah, that's the most efficient form that we uh, come out from our experience. We'll um, that's the easiest way to achieve NZB. Yeah, and uh, use energy simulations in order to ensure the design is the most energy efficient form. And uh, the last one is a grid connections with the grid in order to uh, sell your power from your buildings to the power grid. Then uh, we'd like to show you an example. We call it Intensity. It's in Grenoble in France, which is um, a carbon neutral building in uh, Schneider, uh, which is uh, also very new. We brand it as a a building of the future. So what is it? Then, um, to be very honest, is uh, carbon or the energy consumption by the design is just one-tenth of the conventional buildings, as you can see here. The fourth uh, bullet point is uh, 37 yeah, kilowatts per meter square, which is just around uh, one-tenth. Yeah, the conventional one, the average, European average, is uh, 350 kilowatts. And how they can do so? Of course, they use a lot of different uh, digital analytics to optimize the energy consumption and, um, uh, and also to control the people flow yeah, and uh, control the occupancy so you can adjust the energy consumption on a real-time basis. And it has 60,000 uh, points, we call it sensors, uh, distributed throughout the entire building um, in order to gather all the data and help the, um, the, the, the people there um, to make uh, decisions in order to control or optimize the energy consumption. And on the right-hand side, you can see is the portfolio that we have, no matter it's on the hardware on the bottom side, and also on the edge control, the middle layer, and help you to monitor and control, and also on the upper layer, we mean the digital analytics, where we have different kinds of um, digital analytics to help you to optimize the uh, power consumption, no matter it's in the building and also in the, in the microgrid there. Yeah. Show you the energy balance that you have. The upper side is the uh, power supply, okay, two megawatts from the grid, and around one megawatt from um, the solar panels and also the wind turbines. We also have the battery, yeah, and in order to balance the uh, renewable energy generation and consumption. Then the total consumption in the year is uh, 970 megawatt hour. Yeah, that's the energy consumption. And the major demand or the area you can see is uh, we have EV lighting, water heaters, uh, heating, ventilation, and the plugs. Then uh, the line share actually is from the heating and also ventilation. It makes up two thirds of the power consumption. But if you look at the uh, upper layer, then it's two-thirds of the power actually from the green, but the green one is the, is the green power. Okay, we do the uh, power purchase agreement uh, with the local power utilities to uh, make sure that we buy, what we buy is the uh, renewables, yeah, and also green power, and of course we have some uh, on-site and off-site renewables. You can see a PV and also wind, yeah. Then what are the solutions we have in the intensity? Uh, 
mostly we use our own solutions. Uh, we put our uh, solutions into very good use. You, uh, we will divide it into the four key areas, which are the four core values we believe in the buildings of the future. Sustainability, resilience, hyper-efficiency, and also people-centricity. Sustainability that we've already mentioned a lot, uh, hip pumps and solar power and um, smart grid, okay, yeah, though, uh, and also the uh, power purchase agreement with, to source the uh, green power. For the resilience, like reliability that um, we have, yeah, in order to help us to uh, make sure the power supply is re reliable. And uh, in case of any emergency or things happen, we can rebound it very quickly. Hyper-efficiency to enable end-to-end -end and also remote control of all the equipment uh, on site, especially in the COVID time. A lot of people are talking about working from home, then this is sort of very important. And what we see the mega trends in the world is looking for the remote control solutions. And lastly, centricity. Don't forget, 90% of our time in the buildings, actually, no matter you work, you sleep, or you play, 90% of your time in the buildings. And that's why we need to increase the well-being, the comfortability, and also the convenience in, in the buildings. Yeah, that's what we have, all the solutions in order to cater on those areas. No matter is to increase the energy efficiency, reduce the carbon emission, and enhance our well-being in the buildings. So, now, Let's come back to Hong Kong, yeah, because we uh, went to Grenoble for five minutes. Then um, come back to Hong Kong. So what should be the renewable energy options? We talk about the supply side. Um, actually, we have different priorities. The first one, very high priority, we call it generation. You have the on-site renewables. On the rooftop, for example, the PV panels, on-site renewables, or off-site, which is very popular in uh, countries uh, away from Hong Kong, yeah, but uh, in Hong Kong, because of the limitation of land, then off-site renewables are not very popular. And the medium one will be the purchase. A lot of people are talking about the power purchase agreement, especially in China, yeah, you know, to source the green energy, but um, due to the limitation, and Hong Kong is not very available right now, but we can see, well, if we look into the future, then we believe it is still possible. And of course, renewables from the other um, dirt is a distributed energy sources on the green. Okay, if peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading, uh, renewable trading is allowed, then we can also have this. And lastly, green grids. Okay, the utility if it is powered by the hydrogen or the uh, carbon capture equipped uh, power grids, then it will all be the green power grids. And lastly, it will be the uh, offset to buy the renewable energy certificate. Yeah, this is the way to achieve the carb uh, carbon neutral. So we look into Hong Kong, what are the barriers? Okay, the picture is very nice, a very rosy picture that we have. It is very possible to achieve. But don't forget, in, uh, the, in Hong Kong, our electrical loading is the, um, uh, just like in this morning that uh, we heard that the per capita energy consumption is the highest in the world. Very large consumption, but very small generation. So why we have the large, very large consumption? Because of the ventilation, because of the chillers. Don't forget, 40 to 50% of our energy consumption comes from buildings, right? Um, because of the very hot and humid, just like right now, 30 degrees Celsius outside. And um, on the generation side, supply side, yeah, um, only solar is available, that's what we can see. Yeah, just one or two projects in Hong Kong is just the wind toy turbines. We don't have a very strong wind resources in Hong Kong, but solar, yeah, we have. Uh, but it only installed on the rooftops, which is the footprint is very small. And don't forget one thing is, the, um, for the solar panels to achieve a very uh, efficient or effective operation, you must have the economies of scale, which means you have very large rooftop, but in Hong Kong we don't. Yeah, very small and tall buildings. Yeah, some buildings are very uh, short, and because of the shading effect, um, the energy output actually is not very strong. Yeah, and some rural areas is suitable, but uh, at the same time, we have some regulations on the, on the use of land, and we also need to address. Uh, for, uh, no large rooftop, we've already said this, and no land for uh, off-site off uh, renewables, no matter if it's in the new territories or in the other areas. And um, purchase, power purchase agreement, um, not yet available. Maybe we will, it will be available in the future. Yeah, purchase is not really an option at this moment, but we believe uh, things can change. And offset, yeah, REC is available in Hong Kong. You can buy the REC to uh, offset your carbon emissions and to achieve the carbon neutral.
Yeah. So criteria for NZB in Hong Kong, we uh, did some uh, study. Then we believe if we really want to achieve NZB, then uh, what should be the areas? For example, rural and open areas, like uh, in the uh, northern areas, you know, around Seung Sui, around Yunlong areas it will be. And you must have a very large rooftop or piece of land. And the electrical loading will be very small. For example, you don't have the ventilation, and it must be grid accessible because you also need to sell the power to the grid yeah, uh, using the FAT. And better, it will be a new built one yeah, than the retrofit in the old building, existing building. Otherwise, the cost will be very high uh, and subject to a lot of site constraints. And uh, you should build and operate the buildings together. Yeah. And potential locations, for example, the outlying islands, if we need to satisfy all the site criteria here, and also near the border areas, as I said before, like the Sao will be areas, and in the countryside, then uh, you can have a large piece of land. You don't have the other uh, tall buildings to overshadow the buildings, and also Kai Tech terminals that uh, we can look into. Any specific types, to be small, to be open, to be large rooftop. Um, types can be staff quarters and visitor centers, yeah, uh, police or um, the fire stations, a warehouse, a school and parks that you can, uh, if you have any ideas um, or you own any buildings, then you can look into this area and try to achieve the NZB. Then uh, NZB potential, then uh, I would say it would take, it would take uh, time and course. For NZB, um, it is, right now, I believe it is a very small scale, it, which is visible at this moment. That's what we uh, discussed in the previous slide. And or you can achieve it from a very short period of time. Then maybe in the night time, then the electrical loading is more, and you also have the energy storage to release your renewable energy stored in the daytime. Then uh, if we want to make it more visible, then we need some game changes. The game changes are presented in the, or just walk it through in the next slide. Um, the carbon neutral buildings, uh, which is visible, you can use REC to buy the REC from the power utilities to make a carbon neutral building. And the last is near zero building, or people will call, call it the low carbon buildings. Yeah, definitely visible, okay? Because you can control your demand side. You can use the different kinds of equipment, as I said before, energy efficiency equipment, uh, digital analytics, yeah, and fuels which your uh, fuels are from, are from the other fuels to uh, electricity, then it is also visible. But although NZB in large scale is not very visible, we can make your buildings NZB ready. So that's what we focus. And to be ready at this moment. So, and in the long term, the long the the changes, the game changes will be in short term. Of course, you need to more renewables offsite, and you need to have the digital cooling uh, because you are cooling load. You don't have the economies of scale if it is uh, highly uh, decentralized and distributed. But if uh, for digital cooling or heating, then of course it is um more in, in line with the economies of scale. But the digital cooling must be uh, powered by the green energy, yeah. In the medium term, then uh, uh, maybe local utility scale renewables will be, will be more feasible. We are talking about the offshore wind farm, yeah, um, yeah in uh, uh, development of the uh, wind farm in Hong Kong. Then uh, try to see where the cross-border PPA is feasible. And PPA, as I said before, is very uh, popular in China. And um, we are talking about the integration between the China and Hong Kong and uh, cross-border PPA. Um, if it is uh, possible, then of course, then it can also help the buildings here to achieve the um, net zero. And in the long term, then uh, more futuristic, we talk about the virtual uh, power plants, we call it VPP, yeah, uh, different kinds of um, very small scale renewables, DR of the dirt, okay, happening at the same time. We try to optimize the power generation and consumption, okay, like uh, you are no longer in a very uh, centralized power plant, but very decentralized one, yeah, and um, you have the deep. Uh, some some analytics behind to to uh, optimize the operation, and you have the hydrogen power. Yeah, our utilities in Hong Kong may uh, think about or plan the uh, hydrogen power. Yeah, and of course, more futuristic will be the direct carbon absorption from the air. But of course, it's not yet commercialized. It's still in the laboratory uh, scale right now, so it'll be in the lo more long longer term. So our roadmap, uh, last two slides. The first one, I would say, we need to reduce demand in the short term. Yeah, how we reduce it, said before. Use of the highly energy efficient equipment, like heat pumps, like high efficiency chillers. Um, also use, uh, don't forget one thing, is about the power quality that uh, a lot of people will overlook, okay, because, um, because of the use of the IT or computer equipment, especially data centers, we have a lot of harmonics, which consumes a lot of power. Yeah, not very energy efficient. So we need to use the AHF, uh, active harmonics filters. And second thing, yeah, use electricity. Yeah, that's um, uh, because um, 
the very uh, the most energy efficient form of our uh, energy use. Uh, use EV, or the government is also talking about the EV varies. Yeah, and some uh, other countries are talking about the electric aircraft, which is still very long term in Hong Kong, and use electric heating. Yeah, in the kitchen or in the wa water boilers. And uh, lastly, that um that uh, Schneider is really strong as is the, the leverage our digital analytics to optimize the energy, uh, optimize or manage our energy consumption. Yeah, and also the operation and to change our people behavior because most of the time, energy efficiency can be achieved by changing our human behavior. Okay, yeah, but a lot of people also overlooked in the past. And we also need to monitor our sustainability performance, for example, the carbon emissions, yeah, and to manage the microgrid operations. So we have a full suite of portfolio solutions to help our customers to optimize the energy consumption to achieve a net zero building ready yeah, in, the, in the short to medium term. And in the long term, then of course, we will turn to from the demand side to supply side, yeah, use more renewables, okay, no matter you install the on-site or re off-site renewables, and you can use, maybe in the shorter term, then you can use the REC to help you to achieve uh, carbon neutral. And in the medium term, if PPA is available, power purchase agreement, you can also consider it. Okay, for example, if uh, after the development of a very large uh, utility scale renewables, then um, it may be PPA is also available in Hong Kong. Then, of course, um, as I said before, more futuristic will be a cross-border PPA, but we need to subject to the uh, policy, uh, whether it is also feasible. Technically, it's feasible, it's just about the policy. And uh, long-term game changes, hydrogen and carbon emissions, okay, which may not be ready in 10 to 20 years, but afterwards, because we need to look into the future. Yeah, And um, this will be the direction that uh, people will talk about. Yeah, and uh, just a very high-level uh, introduction about our thought in uh, net zero buildings and what are the barriers and uh, what should be the roadmap for us to achieve. And if you want to know more about the story of our intensity, you can just scan the QR code here. Then you have a um, video and more information about the intensity. Yeah, it's just uh, five minutes introduction about the intensity, but it has a lot because it's a very long and full story behind and how we achieve this kind of uh, engineering phase behind behind us. Yo, um, that's my introduction. Then uh, we can turn to the panel discussion to discuss more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for sharing your expertise on energy. Up next, may we invite Ms. Anita Varshney, Global Vice President of Strategy at SAP S4 HANA Sustainability, to give us a keynote speech on SAP Cloud for Sustainable Enterprises, embedding sustainability into your core business strategy and NN value chains. Ms. Varshney, please. Thank you so much for having me today. And let's get this right, it's SAP. So I am part of the SAP, and I'm going to talk here today about what is SAP doing on moving forward on the sustainability goals. And I think thanks to Kelvin for a wonderful presentation, I think, on how the companies, especially here in Hong Kong, because it's all about buildings here and how we get our carbon emissions down. So I think that was a very, very good presentation. And though we see quite a few challenges for the companies here in Hong Kong to go towards their net zero goals, he had some great ideas on how companies can do things in the short term and then have a longer term ready, map ready there. So in my conversation today, I would talk about what is SAP doing globally? How are we helping our customers through our solutions? And then how the move to the cloud can help them prepare for the long-term business. So of course, for us, as you know, SAPs, um, we have a huge, huge uh, base of customers globally. And some of them are much ahead in the curve. They are already onto their sustainability targets for years now. But for us, it's our responsibility that no matter where you are in your sustainability journey, we can give you software solutions, technologies to help you on your goals. So the very first thing is, of course, our mission stays the same. How do we use technologies not only to drive your businesses uh, really nicely, but also in the sustainable way? What does long-term success means to you? And given that we all are living through COVID, we all know that resilience is something we all aspire for. And ultimately, bringing these two together, both being profitable but also being resilient, is a fine art of balance. And that's where we want to work with our customers on creating a sustainable world together. So how do we do this? 
So of course, we come from our own journey. We just celebrated 50 years of SAP, and we've done so much over the years to understand what does it mean to have sustainable operations. So what you see on this slide is, A, how is SAP themselves being sustainable? Where do we run our operations today? How do we purchase today? As Kelvin mentioned, scope three emissions are definitely the most challenging ones, but SAP is already moving forward, whether it's about looking at our travel emissions, our procurement, and so on. And this has been built over many years, so that we are going towards our own net, new, net, net uh, neutral targets. But it wants things to do something in our own operations. The majority of SAP's emissions are through the products that we sell, through our software that we sell. So our scope three downstream emissions are the highest. And that means it's the responsibility of us to work with our customers who buy our products to help them get their emissions down, to do better on managing their waste and be more socially responsible. So we have four areas where we go into deep. So the first one is how do we work with our customers to bring their carbon emissions down? not only at a corporate level, but also looking deep into their manufacturing operations. How do we work with our customers to embed circularity principles as they are you know, going through the different parts of the supply chain, and then being more socially responsible? Because ultimately, I think, um, as it was mentioned earlier, it's all about people aspect. How do we manage our people in a much, much better way? And as we can see, the regulations, right? Um, we can see it globally. We can ha see it in our neighboring countries. How important is it for the regulations to know that you, know, you are being more sustainable? So let me go a little bit deeper on each of the topics. The first thing is climate action. So SAP thinks that first thing, you know, measuring, really understanding where do you stand with your emissions today. Not only what has been manufactured in your plants, but also at a product level. And that's about you know, looking deep within your enterprise, where is your carbon emissions coming from today? The second topic we look at is carbon data networks, and that goes into scope three topic, and we will touch on that in the panel today, so I would not go into details there. But SAP, for the first time, together with software vendors, have shown how we can change, exchange this data in a trusted way with our suppliers and with our customers. And it goes beyond saying, right, we can see it from the SEC in US, we can see the carbon tax kicking off in 2024 in Singapore, where it goes $25, and that's where we see that there is a regulations coming in, your stakeholders want clear accounting on your carbon emissions, how do you bring that in a trusted, auditable way to your stakeholders? So carbon accounting is a hugely important topic, and especially I come from the world of SAP, where we are known for our financial modules. That means if the carbon emissions sits in the same finance module, what does carbon accounting look like? So those are some of the big topics that we are looking at in climate action. When you look at circularity, I think we've talked about waste in the previous session. But here, the longer term goal is that how do you embed circularity in the each and every part of your process? Right when you know, you're designing your process, you're designing your products, minimizing your waste, but at the end cycle, how do you bring it back? How do you bring your materials back in your value chain? When you look at social responsibility, I think it has come, COVID has actually made it even more visible than it was visible before. How do you work not only with your own employees, but also across your supply chain? What are the human practices that you have upstream and downstream with your value chain partners? And finally, holistic steering and reporting. And I think uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange anyways have very rigorous rules on the banks and the financial institutions here. And that's for a reason. Because of all the greenwashing that we see around us, even the biggest banks being called out, it's very important for our customers to get this ESG data, no matter what state it is to visitable to the stakeholders, because only then you can forge partnerships to actually move forward in your sustainability ambitions. So auditability has been a big, big ask you know, from our customers, and that's where we go about that how do you get this in a timely way, not a yearly exercise where you give your sustainability report and get done with it, but actually steer your business realizing that if you're not meeting your sustainability goals, what can business leaders do about it? And finally, that's where the digital transformation comes in, because we have been all driving our business with the sole purpose of profits. And how do you add a green line to it? How do you add the sustainability to it? So for us, it was very important that if our customers have to embed these decisions deep into their processes, we need to go deep within ourselves. What does it mean for industries? SAP is in 25 industries. How can different industries adopt sustainability? You might be an oil and gas customer versus a re real estate customer, all our industries that we work with are going through this transformation. Moreover, 
We have customers who might be using our HR solutions, who might be using our procurement solutions. Each solution that SAP sells in the market, what does it mean to embed sustainability? If you are a procurement manager, when you compare your vendors, not only you compare them on their cost and their quality, but also on their carbon emissions. And that's how you want to work with your suppliers and get the visibility right from the start as you start with your supply chain. And finally, business technology platform. It's a platform play. Sustainability is a game which cannot be done alone. And that's where we need to work with our partners. And these can be technology partners, our suppliers, our customers. And that's where having a platform which allows you to adopt and work towards these goals in an agile way is what our customers want. And that's how we bring the entire picture of sustainability together. So we're working on platforms across processes and together with our ecosystem. So I think I would want to stop with you know, this last example where I want to go a little bit deeper because I've shown you the bigger picture of what SAP wants to achieve. But this is just one example on how we are achieving carbon transparency end-to-end -end way. So I think we talked about the scope three um, uh, earlier today, right? So of course, within your own enterprise, you are able to measure and report on your carbon emissions. And SAP has environment management and product footprint management to do this. But the major challenge was, how do I exchange this data with a supplier who sits upstream who might not use SAP? Or a customer who wants to engage 10 of their suppliers who don't have SAP? And that's where we work with the World Business Council. For those of you who heard the keynote in the morning from Peter Baker, um, and there what we have done together with other software providers, we have shown that how you can exchange this data in a meaningful, auditable, trusted way with your suppliers and downstream with your customers. And that's a very big goal because you don't need to have the same solution. You only need to speak the same language. And that communication has been defined with a major stream of customers with the likes of Unilever and others who have tested that this communication works. So why this is a very big thing? It is a big thing because today, you might want to dump your scope three onto another party and say, not my headache, it's yours. And that's why with this, exchange of data, you are putting a quality and assurance behind it that I am taking care of your scope three emissions. In the earlier session, we talked about carbon offsets, we talked about RECs, we talked about the entire journey on your, your net neutral goals. But those journeys only make sense if you are making sure that you are reducing your emissions in every way possible. If you look at the science-based targets, the guidance is that you have done everything possible to reduce your scope one, two, and three emissions before you're relying on offsets, carbon capture, and all that. So that's why with this, the, uh, I think what brings forward is that if you have the control on your emissions data, which flows not only through your own enterprise, but within your suppliers and your customers, you have a much bigger say on reducing your carbon targets. And then, you know, it, it goes without saying that it is a chain of suppliers, right? It's not just a first supplier. And that's why we have Green Token, which is a blockchain solution, which allows you to have the chain of custody on where your emissions are coming from. And bringing that whole picture together in Sustainability Control Tower, which is the form of our ESG reporting. Because ultimately, the stakeholders need not only what you're doing within your own company to reduce your emissions, but what you do externally, right, with your suppliers and your customers to get your numbers down. So we can go a little bit more about this on the panel, but I think that was my last slide. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Farshni. Please remain on stage and be seated for the panel discussion. Moving on, we are pleased to have Engineer C.F. Leung, Director of Operations at BEC, to moderate this discussion. Similar to the previous session, online participants are welcome to use the Q&A box if you have any questions for our speakers. For audience in the room, please raise your hands and we will pass you the mic. I will now pass the time to our moderator. CF, please. Okay, thank you, Christy, for introducing me. So uh, we have a strong uh, panelist in this section. So may I also invite uh, our, another keynote speaker in this session, Mr. Kelvin Lee, to come to the stage? Right, thank you. Right, and we have uh, three another uh, panelists. Uh, maybe the first one, may I introduce, invite uh, Mr. Travis Ken, Head of Digital Solutions of CLP Group, <laughs> and Professor David Sprocha, uh, Director, Sustainability Net Zero Office from Hong Kong USD. Right. Have you better sit 
under your photo, right? <laughs> then lastly is uh, Mr. Raymond Nair, Chief Technology Officer from Huawei Hong Kong. Right, so uh, I have around uh, 40 minutes for the panel discussion, right, including the Q&A section. Um, we would like to focus on three topics here, right? The first one is the focus how to inno how innovation and digital transformation will support and scale the net zero transition in Hong Kong. The second one is discuss the challenge ahead. And lastly, we will discuss uh, identify the enabling factors uh, that facilitate a successful uh, transition. Um, maybe I start with some warm up question for um, Travis and Raymond first, right? To Travis, right? Can you please introduce yourself and not yourself, right? But the CLP e business, right? I, I saw you in different locations, involving okay. in so many things, right? So, can you please briefly let us know uh, what's your CLP e business about? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, uh, to start with, maybe uh, to the today's topic about net zero. I guess just to start with, talk about CLP's role in net zero. So we have, uh, I think, four key steps to work with our customer. First step is about how we provide green energy, green electricity to the customer. So, uh, and then, uh, or even low carbon, ultimately zero carbon electricity. The second step is while we're providing low carbon is uh, about uh, electrification, no matter from EV charging or to like uh, heating or cooking type of solutions. Uh, the third one is about all the operation energy efficiency solutions, you, if for Hong Kong is specific for buildings. And then the last step is the offsets, like we could leverage our uh, investment like in India, renewable, so that we can bring uh, carbon credit back to Hong Kong. So these are the four steps. Specific for CLP uh, e-solutions, we, we are involved in all these four stages. For example, the first stage, we, we help customer build like uh, uh, rooftop solar. Uh, and we also have a launch solution for uh, battery storage for um, construction site. <coughs> so it's alternative to reduce, to avoid uh, diesel generation in construction site. For EV charging is something we've been doing a lot, uh, no matter quick chargers or different intelligence system that help customer install in different situation. Uh, and then uh, for Building energy efficiency, we, we, we did a lot. Uh, just one example, like uh, we deploy a lot of uh, using AI technology in terms for chiller pan optimization, because uh, as Kelvin also mentioned earlier, for Hong Kong, building is the main energy consumption for cooling is the major part for, for building. So we target that. So when we deploy this kind of like optimization solution, we can apply not just new building, but all the existing building. And uh, it saves like 10 to 20% of the energy of the cooling. So basically by applying some real-time AI control, so these are core things that we did. And uh, at the same time, we also uh, try to have different business model, I would say, like for, again, for cooling. So for customer, so happen reaching aging of the chilapan, we also have an alternative model, like a cool, what we call cooling as a surface. So basically, we have a, we have a customer to redesign install and then operate maintain for them. So we invest for the chiller plant. We basically just ensure a 10, 15 years uh, very high efficient cooling system for them. So they basically have a peace of mind by using our expert service. So that's an alternative way we help. So these are the example uh, that how we help along this like, net zero journey. Right, thank, thank you, Travis. And my next question to Raymond. We know that Huawei is a leading world-class company in different areas, right? Like 5G, artificial intelligence, et cetera, right? So can you please say a few words about your business in Hong Kong? Okay, no problem. Uh, extra, uh, at Huawei, uh, our innovation focus on customer needs. So that um, we invest quite a lot uh, in the, in the uh, basic research. We concentrate a lot in the technology, technology, technology breakthrough as well so that uh, you want to drive the world forward. Um, as everyone knows, uh, we are a, a global provider in the ICT and smart devices for the market. But more than that, we also want to commit to bring digital to everyone, from customer, consumer, from the uh, carriers, and also for the enterprises. So starting from last year, 2021, uh, we Huawei uh, start to build up an end-to-end uh, -end complete portfolio for the digital power which means that we want to bring a much more secure, reliable end-to-end -end portfolio for the power products, the power technology, 
and also some kind of a green solution uh, to, to, and to, to bring the world much more digital and much more green. This is our, our wish. And also, um, uh, uh, because we want to, uh, to work with a much more ecosystem partner as well in Hong Kong, so we like to work with partners. We want to collaborate with different people in Hong Kong to uh, empower the, the, the people to enrich the home life. And also we want to, to, um, to, uh, to, to make everyone uh, much more digital and much more connected. So this is our business in Hong Kong. But you mainly focus on the business sectors of the, say, individual, say, the household thing, right? Uh, actually, we cover much more than that. We cover from the industrial product to the household. All right, thank you. So, Dave is right. Congratulations for setting up the Net Zero office in UST, right? Can you briefly let us know what's your role in this Net Zero office? Yeah, yeah right. thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, as you, you mentioned, we were the sustainability office. We're now the sustainability Net Zero office, really emphasizing that this Net Zero signifies a huge change. So, for us, we've been looking at, you know, incremental plans, a 2020 plan, a 2028 plan, and you can incrementally reduce your way to those goals. You can't do that to, to net zero. Right. And so that realization has allowed us to really think about, the, you know, the three things that we do at the university. We have, we have our operations, the whole plant and the footprint of our buildings, and then we have an education, we have research. Our goal is to have the, the research and the operations very well aligned. You know, so that as we're trying to find new products, uh, we're trying to do uh, new research that can help us reduce or remove carbon, we want to be able to implement them directly into the campus so that we can demonstrate and we're acting the way that we're teaching in our class. So uh, some of the things that we're, we have that we are very uh, excited about, we have a sustainable smart campus program where we're, in, we're actually uh, implementing many of these. Uh, projects. Uh, as you know, solar panels start to lose their efficiency once it gets warmer outside. So we have a, a number of uh, projects to include phase change materials to try to remove that heat, uh, ways to keep the, the, you know, robotics to try to keep uh, the dust off, things like that. So uh, digital twin, AI, looking at machine learning, there's uh, lots and lots of things actually that were mentioned earlier today in terms of how do we really start to incrementally go through. On the education side, I think this is the key part, because as you may know, we're, I think that most universities are really transitioning into kind of skill building. And some of the big skills that we see for students to understand revolve around life cycle analysis. And life cycle analysis really uh, pinpoints where we are moving in directions that may not be sustainable over time. So, for example, a, a life cycle analysis would look at the impacts of things like renewable energy certificates, for example. If you, you notice that students would immediately pick out that if you're looking for actual carbon reductions, a renewable energy certificate may not do that. And so those are things that come out if you go through the work and you, and you do the... Uh, uh, and, you, and you do that, those kinds of. So we're creating a, a life cycle lab where we'll be focusing on this a lot more. We'll be inviting members of the industry to come join us so that we can really you know, focus on these issues much more broadly and much more systemically. So that getting to net zero, you know, we have some very strong ideas about how we do. And also really um, using this opportunity to challenge our assumptions about what does 2050 look like? It won't look like today. And so we need to start thinking, how do we use our, our assets? Uh, I, I know uh, Kelvin was mentioning about the limited rooftop space, which is very true, but we have a lot of highways. If we had canopies over the highways, I'd like to know how much energy could be generated that way. And so looking at, um, looking at things that are not typically designed for energy production, and then trying to think of how we can challenge those assumptions and try to incorporate those. So that's where we are. Right, but sorry, Davis, I would like to learn more about the uh, life cycle lab, right? Is it just focusing on the new development in UST or you are also using this lab to, to provide a robust database to the industry practitioner on how to calculate the life cycle and body energy? Uh, right? Yes, all, all of the right. above. I think that we're, we're uh, reaching out to members of the industry so that we can work very carefully and uh, effectively to look at the way things are, are, are happening here. We also 
um, believe that understanding life cycle analysis, which includes systems thinking and kind of understanding unintended consequences, is part of that life cycle uh, mindset. And so we believe that we need a lot of new content for teaching that we'll be sharing with the other universities, not just in Hong Kong, but around the world. Right, thank you, Davis. Right. Uh, my next question is to uh, Anita, right? So can you please elaborate a little bit on the net zero supply chain and what is the difficult, what are the difficulties that your customer uh, will encounter, right? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I'll pick up from where David left off, actually. Um, this is about driving systemic change, not only for those students who are doing, but it's also for our customers. So all the companies who have been traditionally designed to just have you know, the most optimal stocks, the highest profits, they have those goals. Now, if you want to change that equation and say, oh, by the way, that also means your carbon footprint is too high, that means you know, going through some balance. And that balance is not easy to come by for the business leaders. So the reason I want to talk about the carbon transparency is because to go to the net zero targets, uh, the companies who are on this journey are often relying on data which has been massaged, which has been estimated. And that's what SAP intends to go away with because that's where our skills lie. So with an intelligent ERP where you have, you rely on the data which comes through your you know, um, enterprise applications, you also want to rely on data which is coming your carbon emissions, right? Which is about you're managing your waste. What is your waste? What is your water footprint? It is this data that you want to reduce over time in a systematic way. And that's where the systemic change comes in. Because if I continue to purchase my raw materials from suppliers who have a high carbon footprint, or even worse, have no idea of their carbon footprint, that is coming into my operations. So it's a systemic change that we want to drive with our suppliers and get that transparency to your end customers. So many customers want carbon labeling on their products. And that data can either be made up or you better be precise about it because there is all greenwashing happening. So what is SAP doing? It's getting embedding those data, which was just about your financials data, it was the material flows, but your sustainability data into each and every step of your process. So one thing is what we want to do is get this transparency in a way that you are taking decisions more proactively and not looking backward, saying that this was my last year's sustainability report. I did not meet targets. Let's look backward. Instead, how do I plan forward and do that better? How do I move to suppliers who know about their carbon emissions or at least intend to start measuring it and reporting it? How do I look at suppliers who are already putting human capital in, you know, in practice, looking at the social side of things? And then taking that forward because that effect amplifies. And that's where I think customers who understand product footprinting, who understand these RECs, who understand that they can't immediately jump to offsets without taking care of the foundational stuff, those kind of customers are ahead of the curve. And of course, these are the bigger customers because they have been using Excel sheets to manage sustainability uh, in, a, in, a, in a small way or the other. But now SAP is allowing them to scale because unless you scale that number, you can't really achieve your emissions. So for us, uh, what we did last night was a press release, what we came out with WBCST, is that A, we give the communication approach, how do you exchange this data? And next, you get assurance. So for those of you who are into regulations, SEC and FRAG requires you to give reasonable assurance on your sustainability reporting. Reasonable assurance means that you have your data validated by an auditor. Now for us, that's a number one priority for our customers, that when we get the reports out from SAP, those data can be validated. They do not rely on the secondary databases. That means emission factors which have been made up. But instead, we are you know, forcing business leaders to bring this transparency in as they take these decisions. So for us, it's, it's a systemic change. It goes through data. And then using that data, what can business leaders do to proactively put sustainability decisions together with the profit decisions? It's a balancing act. I'm not saying it's an easy one. But that's what I think the mature leaders of the industry are doing, that they know these tough decisions have to be taken. The business models needs to change. And that happens at each and every level of your organization. Right, does it mean provide, SAP can provide a broad database for, for, the, for your customer when they are purchasing some of the products where right? they, can, they can check the data or, or they can help us to input the, the, the carbon emission from that particular product? 
So, no, we don't do that. Okay. There's a reason for it. Right. So all the benchmarking data that you see outside at an industry level, it has been estimated. It has oh. been massaged. So yes, we have a lot of partners who can give industry benchmarking data saying in automotive industry, what is scope one through three? Who's the highest on their, on their carbon emissions? Mm. But most of this data has been massaged and has not been systematically calculated. So yes, there's benchmarking data available today, mm. but we, it goes with a full caveat that you know, most of this data has been you know, uh, just calculated on the spot and done on a yearly basis. So what we do is we offer that benchmarking data as a starting point, not as your end goal, and say, look at where you stand today. This is what the benchmarking shows with a, you know, with the full caveat. And I think um, for those of you who see the news, the ESG reporting, the ESG rating topic has been on the wrong side of the game. And that's for a reason, because those ratings are made up on these numbers who have no uh, you know, criteria behind them. So we give them a starting point, and then against their own operations, we want them to improve over time. All right, thank you, Anita. Right, right, Kelvin. Right, your presentation mentioned a lot of net zero building strategy. Right, can you tell us more about the, your work in Schneider and the, how 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 the digital transformation of the energy uh, management can drive us to uh, net zero? Okay, yeah, we have quite a lot of solutions, in, especially in the digital analytics. Yeah, and Anita also told us to um, share with us uh, quite a lot of. Uh, very good experience and insights into the um, uh, the use of data, which is also very important. I would say data is the king. Okay, data also underpins the uh, decarbonization sustainability. For example, okay, we have um, the uh, building advisor, okay, which can monitor the energy consumption of the chillers, which makes up fifty percent of the buildings, and it all, it can also tell you the uh, what kinds of insights or energy saving opportunities, okay, happening in the chillers in order to optimize their their behavior or their performance, then it can also calculate, because it's AI-based, the uh, energy-saving potential, and it could help you to recommend the necessary actions taken to um, you know, optimize the performance. And why can we do so? As I said, it's AI. Yeah, we have uh, over one million buildings around the world have already installed these uh, building advices, and it learns every day, every minute, and every second. And that's why it becomes more and more expert-like. Okay, yeah, so that's the, the um, I think is the, um, the most powerful weapon okay, for our tenants to um, achieve the energy efficiency and uh, better energy management. Another thing is, okay, which uh, we call it a resource advisor, just like um, and it is that before. Okay, it can help you to monitor the scope one, scope two, and even uh, scope three, the carbon emissions. Okay, and a uh, lot of um, our customers right now, they uh, try to engage their upstream players. Okay, in order to uh, help them to monitor the uh, carbon emissions, as uh, we could see from the presentation this morning. Okay, um, your scope three emission is someone scope one or scope two emissions. Uh, yeah, which is also very important because. At the end of the day, if we really need to drive the decarbonization in the whole world by okay net zero, no matter it's uh, 200, uh, 2050 or um, any year, one thing is you need to have the entire ecosystem uh, to decarbonize. Okay, um, this is also a very important approach because we need to engage the ecosystem. Yeah, okay. A lot of people right now talking about how we can do better by ourselves, how we can decarbonize by ourselves. But don't forget, at the end of the day, you need to engage the others. Okay, engagement is very important in order to help the whole world to get decarbonized and achieve the net zero targets in uh, 2050. Right. But any successful story in ju not just the intensity of project, right? But can you share a little bit more with us? Any other project can a succeed um, using your solutions can achieve a substantial carbon e emission reduction, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you talk about Hong Kong, then we have a very one of the largest uh, property developers in Hong Kong. They're using our building advisors. So every year, they okay, they save a ten to twenty percent of energy saving. Yeah. Um, because of our energy advisors, because of the very uh, insightful, actionable items uh, discovered by our advisor. So that's the the thing that um we are working on it, and they are very happy. And at the same time, we also learned one thing. Okay. At the beginning, they are your customers, but along the journey down the road, then they will become your partners. Okay, no longer, because in our philosophy right now is, okay, your customers, actually no longer your customers, your customers will become your partners. They will tell you, that they will share with you the uh, user experience in order to help you to improve 
the uh, performance of your, your systems or equipment or your product solutions, which is very insightful because we, sometimes we stand on the other side of the river. We can't see what's happening on the other side, although we are trying best to see. But if once they share their insights, they help us to improve. So that's, that kind of engagement is already is also very important and actually on their side they will also say I have a lot of tenants I need to do the tenants engagement as you can see it will become um, like more like an entire ecosystem engagement and some people will talk about scope 4 right now not more than scope 3 scope 4 but some people will say yeah, not um, uh, scientifically defined right yeah <laughs> but uh, how to help your customers to decarbonize and that's the scope 4 Okay, and I could see the world is also moving into this way, not just your upstream, but also your downstream. Yeah, and yeah. that's the approach the entire world should take. Right, fully agree, right? Stakeholder engagement is very important, right? We all have to work together to achieve a, the, the common goal, right? So um, for the interest of the audience, right, for a question to all the speakers and the panelists, right? So um, what are the uh, emerging innovation solutions that would facilitate the net zero transition? Or maybe I elaborate like this, right? If I, I have to do one thing tomorrow, right? So what, what would you do? What would you suggest, right? In terms of um, innovation or digitalization, right? Yeah, maybe see if I, right. I start with. So I definitely t I will cover the like data or around data analytic type of things that we'll do. I just take an example. I see many like custom being collect, like building energy data in the past. So for the portfolio building that they're managing, but when you see like how much energy consumed every month, what insight gives you, or even it use ten percent more, five percent less, what what's that mean? So you you basically need more data. So how right now what we're working with customer help them is to really understand is it like how much contribute to because of the temperature compared to the previous year, the same month, or how much is because of the for example a shopping mall, a commercial building? Is it I got more event, more, got more people through? Actually, it's a good thing. But it's not why, why I'm challenging by my sustainability manager or boss say I use more energy. So maybe it's about the F&B or the office utilization. So, so a lot of analytics can be do. So right now we're helping customers to ensure they really can analyze the data, give them insight how actually their uh, energy saving measure contribute to all the energy. Uh, reduction rather than mastered by many other activities. So, so I definitely, I think the, the energy parks is a core thing. So on energy, uh, on, on the data side, I think another part is like what we did in, in terms of using AI in, in the energy, in, in the data. So I think USD is also one of the advanced user using like our AI technology look at thousands of their building data. So basically that helped them to like uh, maintain the comfort environment for, for the campus, but at the same time, avoid energy energy loss and, and avoid that to be rely on the quality of the subcontractor or the, or the somehow it could be the retirement aging challenge of the FM. So basically, I think works around data is a, is a core thing to, to this. Right. David, do you agree with Travis, right? Don't mention your USD project, right? Yeah, we. I, I think I couldn't agree more. The data is so important. Everything that everything revolves around data. If you don't see it, you can't measure it. You can't fix it. You know. I think a lot of the energy efficiency is basically we just see things that are not working right. You don't feel it in the inside of the building, but the data shows it. So, uh, so uh, yeah, I'm very glad glad to hear that. I guess to answer your question, I think if there was one thing that I would that mm -hmm. I would point to, I think it is that we really, really need to be accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't agree more with what uh, Anita was just saying, that we have two major problems here. One is of scope uh, and scale, and the other one is that this is a systemic problem. And I think that by not being accurate, sometimes we're giving the wrong impression about how big and massive this problem is. Net zero globally, not net zero in Hong Kong, but net, net zero globally. Um, and sometimes we give the wrong impression. We talk about new buildings that are that are green, they're beam platinum and so forth. And then we fall into these very bad traps of saying, well, this building is gonna save money or save uh, energy. No, it doesn't save energy. Every new building, except for the one net zero building uh, that was built down the road from here, every single one of those is a net energy increase to the grid. Not, it's only the existing buildings that have the capacity to actually reduce. So I, you know, being very accurate about that, that's I think in terms of the accuracy, in terms of the scope, why this is very important is that we need to understand what these 
solutions mean. Um, so let me give you an example. We have um, a lot of enthusiasm about hydrogen, and certainly hydrogen will be a part of the solution, for, especially for things like long-range uh, aircraft, long-range shipping, uh, steel manufacturing, aluminum manufacturing, or certain, certain areas where uh, their hydrogen may be the only option that, that is available that can produce the kind of energy services that we need. But uh, recent estimates are, are, are looking at what do we need in order to provide hydrogen over time. And the latest uh, extensive comprehensive study that I've just come across says that between now and 2050, we will have to triple the amount of renewables from what we have today. And all of that will have to go directly into hydrogen. None of it will go on the grid, all into hydrogen. It will cost 5.8 trillion US dollars, which is fine. I think that's a good investment. Another 200 billion for piping and updating the infrastructure. And after all of that, because our energy consumption is so great, the total displacement will be 0.5% between now and 25, or 20, 2030, and a maximum of between 5 and 8% at uh, 2050. So there's a lot of enthusiasm about hydrogen, but we have to be real and we have to be accurate to say hydrogen is not going to be the wonder fuel that's going to save us. So in our, you know, in our, uh, in our world and sustainability thinking, we always talk about these sustainability thinking blunders, STBs. One of them is that technology will save us. And I think that we have to be very accurate to say that sometimes technology just simply can't save us because of the scope which means that what we have to do is we have to rethink what we're doing. And as Anita said, you know, maybe we don't need all of these data centers here in Hong Kong. We don't have a good supply of renewable energy here, but maybe if we can do all of our data computation on the, on the cloud, then all of those services could be done in a place that has an abundance of renewables. And you know, looking at those kinds of things with the eye of how do we maximize what we do well here? How do we minimize what we don't do well? And how do we try to offshore um, with, the, with the understanding that we're going to have to make some very difficult choices? Right, thank you, David. So I certainly have a thought, right? Talking about, you, you mentioned data accuracy, right? You know that we are using IoT to measure a lot of data, right? And then um, we also have the AI to learn machine learning. So uh, because human being cannot handle such a lot of data, right? Uh, I, I get from the information from Travis before, right? One building, one day can have more than 10,000 data, right? Maybe the data can be locked every five seconds, right? So we are using the AI to, uh, to analyze the data, right? Do you afraid that the people would not care about the data in future, right? We just, they just want to know the result. Because in the, in the, the process, right, they, they don't care, right? They just want to know the result. But is it the right direction? Um, maybe Travis or uh, Kelvin what, what, can supplement on this one. What, what I can add is, like, yet it will be, because when you got thousands of data, you won't look at every single data. So you, that's why you got other tools help you to make sure the data quality, everything is, uh, is good. And you, you probably will only look at the insight from those data where the AI or software present to you. So uh, they may capture a certain part of the data which is meaningful to you, or even just give you uh, the interpretation of the data. So I, so, so that's the trend. Because otherwise, it's no way you got you put people look at every single data and then tell you what ex what exactly that means. And, and supplement from Kelvin, right? Yeah. I fully agree with Travis. And data and people, technology and human, actually, they must be the combination. As we also, uh, we always. Um, tell our customers and also our, our customers share with us. And one thing is, okay, we have a lot of data and how to draw out very insightful, uh, actionable items. And that's the most important thing that uh, we, or how we leverage the data. And we have a, a sentence, it's called uh, food by data. Actually, data don't tell lies, but it can, actually it can, it can fool you. Yeah. So one thing we really need, when we really need to do the data analysis, no matter it's from a digital analytics or the other things, don't be fooled by the data. And 
so far as right now, okay, although we have AI, at the same time, we also have our human intelligence in order to interpret the data in the right way. I think it's also very important, okay? That's our, what we have learned from our experience, no matter by ourselves or, for, or from our, our customers. Yeah. All right. All right. Raymond, any supplement on this one? Because you are also involving in this kind of business, right? Uh, actually, digitalization in Huawei uh, uh, can generate much more power because uh, we, are, we have uh, empowered the, the technology in the AI and big data from our core competency. So that's how, by using the AI, we can uh, auto-checking the sun, the direction, and also we can uh, fine-tune the direction of the solar panel to absorb the core energy. So this is our technology we are using in mainland China and also Hong Kong today. And also, uh, we have also uh, some kind of digital digitalization technology to bring the traditional data, the traditional energy into some kind of information uh, to, correct, uh, to collect the energy flows correctly. So that uh, our Huawei can provide precise and accurate data acquisition from the edge gateway into our uh, digitalized platform. So that we can also provide some kind of digital platform uh, correctly for our customer to interact, to integrate, and also to uh, optimize the energy flow uh, from different dimensions. Okay. All right. Thank you. So Anita may would like. Yeah. yeah. I just uh, wanted to build upon some of the topics that were discussed. Um, uh, yes, data is important, but I do have customers who expect who come to me and say. I buy SAP and I go sustainable overnight. And I said, that doesn't happen. Right. Uh, just because you have the data out there doesn't mean the other things don't work, like governance, like people behind it. What are the metrics that you go against? So I think uh, it's very important to assume that there is no one solution or overnight solution which will solve and make us sustainable overnight. So I think um, uh, there are two, three things which matter. One is partnerships, right? Uh, PPA was a good example that we discussed earlier. If we are able to have cross-border uh, power purchase agreements, that is going to go in the long term. Uh, David, you mentioned hydrogen. Uh, it's a much hyped up topic, but without any underground knowledge to it that to achieve and to use hydrogen in a scalable way, we are far from there. And, and really look at what the neighboring countries are doing. And that's where I think they're using other policies and mechanisms to move forward on their net zero targets. I'll take one example. Um, Singapore has carbon tax uh, for years now, and they are going from $5 to 25 in, in 2023. And I think that huge jump shows how serious they are to reduce their carbon emissions. Now, if we have these supporting policies in place, and I think, um, by bringing these ideas together, I think the highway example was a good example where you have the panels over the Hong Kong highways, is how do we get these ideas together from businesses across Hong Kong so that we can elevate this to the government and sh you know, help them to move policies? Because having things in new territories would help, but not in a scalable way. How do you get that to the other buildings in Hong Kong? And, and as David said, we, we don't really have net zero new buildings. It, it, it's just not possible, right? We can cover it all with plants up, but it will still consume more energy, right? So getting really true to your sustainability targets and accepting that you need to work with your partners to get your footprint down, and then using data within the perspective of the person it relates to. So for example, if I have my chief sustainability officer who's responsible for reporting, how does that person work with the purchasing department? Because the purchasing department is interacting with your suppliers, right? How do you change those relations in a systemic way and then reflect that to your stakeholders? So I think um, even Hong Kong, China, we are at risk of you know, the ESG transparency which needs to come from companies on how are you taking actions to move towards your targets. And that's where AI, uh, ML, they have their place, but those models only work if your underlying data sources are correct. And I think that's where we are urging and working with business leaders that you know today you might be using your SAP systems for certain processes, but then if you have to embed a sustainability dimension, what are the kind of data needs do you have? What is the data quality that you need? And uh, data availability, that's another big issue with uh, sustainability space, right? You don't have data available. Today, companies are not measuring within their own operations what are the footprints, right? So data availability remains a huge challenge for many customers. So I think putting this into perspective and putting this reality in front of us that there would be data challenges, but that doesn't mean you can't have a roadmap towards your net zero ambitions. And that's where I think the partnerships really make a huge difference 
not only within your own company but also externally with the ngos with the with the government with the universities and i think those kind of partnerships can really help move the agenda forward All right, thank you anita right so um time is running out and i don't want to um, overrun this session too much right may i know if there are any questions from the floor No problem. That's that's fine because I saw some question on I right. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So, um, a question to Raymond, right? How how do you share more about the net zero commitment and the roadmap for Huawei, and any plan to produce net zero embedded carbon devices, right? Okay, about uh, net zero uh, energy transition or net zero carbon uh, transition to zero percent in two thousand uh, twenty fifty. Our Huawei is committed to provide a much more advanced solution from the power generation, uh, energy storage, uh, distribution, and even uh, consumption, just like the EV chargers. Because as we know, we have much more EV cars, which means much more EV charger today in Hong Kong, which means it will incur much more higher demand to the grid power. So that uh, in order to prevent from this kind of uh, increasing demand to a specific building, so uh, our Huawei is now committed to provide a single page solution to combine these four from generation to consumption all together in order to reduce the increasing demand from the grid. Just take an example, if we can provide our energy storage system to a, uh, to a building, then we can uh, store the energy at night time, and then we can restore the energy during the, the peak hour at daytime, so that we can reduce the demand uh, to, to the grid power. So it's our commitment uh, to, to Hong Kong and to the world to bring the less zero uh, uh, carbon emission target before 2050. Right, so how about the product side, right? Still uh, investing some of the uh, products that will become net zero uh, from the manufacturing and the, the fun, to the final product, right? Okay, for sure. We have uh, also uh, got a lot of, uh, uh, for example, our smart device, our ICT product, which is also targeting at the less zero target before 2050. So we are not only working uh, 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 in our uh, in our city wise in our branch office. We also work, work, work working very hard in our factory in our headquarters in, in China. All right. Thank you, Raymond. So um, I think the last question, right, is the from Austria consulate, right? So the question is that in Europe we use very strict regulations and grants or subsidies and pilot projects realized by the government to steer the COVID neutrality drive. So from the uh, panelist's point of view, what would Hong Kong business need from the government to be more encouraged for the change? Right, so start from Davis. Sure, I, uh, yeah, I have, uh, well, that's a great question. And I, yeah. I think, uh, the, and this COVID is, is a great example of how the government can provide positive incentives, negative incentives, all trying to push, uh, push the, the policy outcome that you want. For net zero, I think it's very clear there's a, a couple of things that we really need. Number one, the government immediately could raise the building standards. So our building codes in Hong Kong, you may know, are, are fairly low. In fact, a, a building that's legal in Hong Kong would not be legal right across the border in Shenzhen, just because in Guangdong province, they require things like double glazed windows and so forth. So immediately, you know, really ratchet up the, the building codes so that we're pushing the industry to, you know, to, to be more creative in their designs. So that would be number one. Number two, I think, I think my personal belief is that I don't think we can get to net zero without deregulating the electricity provision, uh, electricity system here, the, the utility system. Um, the, the, the system that we have right now with CLP has been great. It's reliable. It is uh, one of the best in the world. But if we want to unlock the innovation from people in Hong Kong, we need to allow uh, property developers, for example, to get into the energy generation business. You know, look for things that you can do right in your, in your own building to generate electricity, reuse the heat from that electricity generation to provide the hot water. Think of all of the hotels that could be providing all of their services right on their campus or right into their buildings, spreading it out to their neighbors, you know, and letting all of these different ideas and approaches and technologies really flourish here so that we're learning from that and spreading the, the word and having our utilities as kind of the guiding principles that allow, make sure that the grid may stay stable and everything is, is uh, you know, in the, the right space. But 
really unleash the innovation so that we can get these low carbon uh, generation te technologies right into the buildings themselves. And any most panelists would like to supplement? Uh, yes, Anita, right? I think I'll just add, we've talked a lot about electrification today and you know, specifically about how we consume energy, but let's not forget the circular economy side of it because the circularity is extremely important to curb carbon emissions. And if you look at the waste generated by Hong Kong, it is humongous, right? Look at the plastics, look at the amount of materials which is going in dump every day. I'm not saying it's all bad, but it's, it's definitely an upward curve. We have looked in MTR, you have you know, refillable water stations and so on. But the, a large part of carbon emissions also come from the waste generated by the economy. And that's where, again, it's a, a low-hanging fruit. If we try to really control the amount of waste the, the economy is generating, and the number of places that we can recycle and get the materials back into our economy. I think that would also hugely help us on our net zero goals. And ultimately, making this a community thing, right? Because as long as people are individually invested in moving towards the targets, I think that will help the economy move much faster. See if I, I, I may have a little different view from what David Gensler mentioned about, especially around like devaluation, because I, I probably see the current environment in Hong Kong, like campus or other uh, business, they can still build their own uh, distributed generation other uh, to, to connect, to reinforce their generation. I think that, that part doesn't, uh, is still working. Uh, but what I want to focus is even the, like the carbon tax or other things. I think those may help, because currently what we see is about the motivation of many business in, in moving on. They may have a long-term, medium-term about net zero plan, but when it comes back to execution, usually our conversation is, what about the return on investment? Uh, is it a two-year payback, three-year payback? Then uh, without other pressure or cost element, the business basically will not put a lot of resources and move on. So, so I think that any, no matter it's a mandatory requirement on the call, or it's a certain carbon tax or other things, otherwise it, it will be continue slow and may probably it, what end up will be like, you get a target, but you're going to miss your target. Yeah, I just add one point and fully agree with all, all of us here, all the speakers here, is, um, okay, we talk about the government, okay, it's policy dri driven. Yes, in the past five years, we can see it is really policy driven. Okay, the, the government needs to set up some environmental policy, okay, or on the economic policies in order to drive the sustainability. But right now, as we can see from the other countries, if we really make reference to it, is the policy driven markets will be become, will become market driven markets. So that's what I can see what's happening in Hong Kong right now. We have sustainability financing is growing at over 100% every year, for example, the green loan application. But we can see we have seen a lot of market forces. We, have, we can see a lot of different kinds of players entering into the ecosystem, no matter it's been banks or in some enablers like uh, technology suppliers, like the consultants, and also um, the bankers, the financiers, like uh, banks or the other kinds of financial institutions. And also on the user side, the consumer side, okay, we talk about real estate, we talk about the utility we can also talk about the other factories. Yeah, they are uh, more and more active in sustainability financing. And that's the trend we really need to observe. It's becoming more and more market-driven. And I think that's really the major or the true force that make things happening in Hong Kong right now. And we will look forward to this. Raymond, you have no, no. Okay, so uh, thank you, the panelists, uh, the insights. Uh, so I think it's very useful to BEC, the advisory group can make a lot of good submission and recommendation to the government. Um, I think we'd like to close this session. May I, uh, maybe we give a big applause to the panelists, right? So Christy, over to you. Sure, thank you for the extremely insightful and relevant sharing. This concludes the morning sessions.